Hello and welcome to Online Church at Baker Memorial United Methodist Church in St. Charles. I'm Pastor Kim Neese and on behalf of myself and Pastor Mary Zajac, we welcome you to this time of connection, community, and worship. Pastor Mary is out on vacation this week and we have the blessing of having retired Pastor Mike Ebersall who will be bringing the message. We're continuing our sermon series called New Things and today's topic is there with him. We have Jeff Hunt and Mark Edwards as our musicians today, and we are blessed to have Rick Spears as our liturgist. We have so many things that we want to let you know about that are happening at Baker Memorial United Methodist Church. We are excited to start a brand new ministry called Administer Justice. And it's today that we have an in-person meeting at 1030 in Wiley Hall that you can find out more information on how you can be part of helping those that are in need and those that are vulnerable, being able to have uh, the abilities to have legal aid. If you're unable to make it in person, we do have a Zoom option on Tuesday, May 24th, and that is at 7 p.m. You can see the tiny URL there that you can click right in there and join us so that you can learn more about the opportunities and how you can partner with Administer Justice to really bring justice to our community. Well, it's time for you to be cleaning out all of those closets. I know mine is stuffed and I've been cleaning it out to bring for the rummage sale. You can start bringing items as early as next week, May 29th, and we are in need of volunteers. You'll wanna be part of helping to set up because what's happening through this rummage sale is actually going to help us to prepare to have a missionary from Cambodia here and that money will go towards that. So you can see on your screen or you can do the QR code how to sign up to volunteer. Any amount of time would be extremely helpful as everything gets organized and then you can stop start shopping that next week. Well, you've been wondering and you've been hearing a lot about this intergenerational VBS, but we haven't told you exactly how exciting and why you might want to be there. And I'm telling you, we are going to have Taco Tuesday for some food. We have a Hawaiian food truck that's going to be there. We have vegetable pizzas that we're going to make homemade with our own ingredients. We also have the opportunity to be able to make some sustainable crafts. This truly is for all ages and you will want to be there and not miss out. Indeed, you'll probably want to invite your friends and family as well. You can see there the QR code to register. We are asking you to register by June 1st to make sure that we have enough supplies for everyone. And of course, we have an opportunity that whether you come or you don't come, that you can volunteer or donate items so that we can have the items that are needed for the VBS. And you can see there again, the QR code and the link to register. Lastly, we wanna be part of making a difference, especially all that's happening in Ukraine right now. And you can do that by donating towards the Bishop's Appeal. That is part of the Northern Illinois Conference. And the Bishop is asking for assistance for Ukraine. Again, you can see the tiny URL and the QR code on your screen there. It's at this time that if you have a candle at your home and a lighter, we'll go ahead and ask you to light a candle. And let's pray together. Oh, gracious God, we come before you today just thanking you for the sense of community thanking you that your presence is always with us, whether we know it or not. We thank you that you are a God that comforts. We thank you for our liturgists, and we thank you for the people that come alongside us in our faith walk to support us. And so as we worship today, may your Holy Spirit just lead and guide us in new ways in our faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Let's continue now as we worship together and sing our song called, This is the Day of New Beginnings. <laughs> Oh. 
This is a reading from the book of Revelations, chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. This is the word of God for all people. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I'm Reverend Mike Ebersaw, a retired United Methodist elder from the Illinois Great Rivers Conference. My wife, Laurel, and I very much enjoy being a part of the Baker Church family. I'm honored today that Pastor Mary asked me to speak, and so on this sixth Sunday after Easter, I greet you with these words. Happy Easter! Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Would you bow with me for a prayer? And now, O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In these post-resurrection days, we look again to the book of Revelation, the 66th and final book of the Bible. As Pastor Mary noted last Sunday, this Bible book is full of imagery and symbolism. Its author, the Apostle John, encourages the faithful to live committed and holy lives as participants in the new times that are unfolding. The very name of this book, Revelation, means unveiling or revealing. By definition, a revelation is a divine or a supernatural disclosure directed to humans and relating to human existence. In other words, some vital information that God wanted us to know. My Old Testament seminary professor at Garrett Evangelical, Dr. Phyllis Byrd, was very fond of saying that the Bible is the church's book. This Bible book reveals to the church the hope that we have through Jesus Christ, following his death and crucifixion, resurrection and ascension. The overarching theme of the book is hope, the realization that God and good will win over evil, no matter how bad things look right now. Once upon a time, a young man sold his very hard-to-start lawnmower to a local minister. The next southern morning, it was very hot, and the minister needed to mow grass, and so he repeatedly pulled the crank on the mower until he was completely and utterly exhausted. The mower simply would not start. He sat down for a while and discussed perspiration rolling from his head, and about that time the lad that had sold him the mower walked by. And the minister said to the boy, Son, seems to me that you have sold to me a mower that just will not start and ultimately will not run. And the lad replied, well, minister, didn't I tell you that the key is you have to curse at the mower in order to get, get it started? Have you cursed at it yet? <laughs> well, the minister said, son, I, it's been many years since I have used profanity. I'm a minister of the gospel. I, I've completely forgotten how to curse. I don't curse at all. And the lad looked at the minister and he said, Well, Pastor, I do believe that if you pull on that rope a few more times, it'll come right back to you. <laughs> Life is full of frustrations, isn't it? 
We've encountered lawnmowers that won't start. In these seemingly continuing days of COVID, we are still experiencing difficulties with product availability. Alongside significant fears and worries about our own safety and health. And then, the price of gasoline. <laughs> there are innumerable annoyances and frustrations that interrupt our days and steal our joy. John's vision transcends our thoughts about the inevitable annoyances and frustrations of life. Rather, he is speaking of a life-altering, earth-shattering, and eternal hope that is grounded in Jesus Christ. We're not talking about hope here in the sense of a, a human desire that a certain thing might occur. In other words, I hope the Cubs win. I hope there will be baby formula at the grocery store, a significant and important hope. I hope this bathroom scale reflects my efforts to become healthier. I hope to find a parking space close to the door in this rain. I hope he stops talking soon so I can go for coffee. <laughs> Reflect with me about the life-altering hope that we experience when we know that God is present with us. I'm speaking about God's presence that brings unexplainable peace and comfort, a holy indwelling that floods our souls when we face the worst thing, the horrible diagnosis, the tragic and unexpected phone call. I'm talking about a God-centered optimism that steadies us when the evening news seems to be nothing but bad news as we shake our heads in disgust at our nation and world that are seemingly fueled by racial anger and violence. The scripture says, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. God's home, in the Greek, refers to the Old Testament understanding of a tabernacling God. The tabernacle was literally a tent that accompanied the Israelites wherever they went in their 40-year trek through the wilderness. The Israelites would go daily to the tabernacle so that they could make their offerings and make connection with their holy God. The tabernacle was the place where God literally dwelled among them and moved with them on their journey. It is interesting to note that God did not dwell in the hearts of human beings until after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Thus, in John's Gospel in the New Testament, we read these words, The Word became flesh and lived among us. Did you catch that? And lived among us. In other words, God, through Jesus, tabernacled, erected God's tent in human form, and dwelled right in our midst. God came near to us in the form of Jesus so that all people, Jew or Greek, all might be included as God makes all things new. In the newness of God's kingdom, we hear assurance that God's home is among the mortals, that God came near through Jesus. The point is that God is very near to us, not distant, not unreachable, not only near to us, but literally within us. God is present in the midst of the worst thing. I recall a conversation once with the United Methodist Bishop in the wake of a horrific typhoon that destroyed property and took the lives of many. The interviewer asked the bishop, why did God allow this to happen? It's a question we frequently ask in the midst of what we perceive to be the worst thing in our lives. And the bishop replied, we're asking the wrong question. A better question would be this, where is God? And the answer, of course, was this. God was present even as the devastation unfolded. God was certainly present in the aftermath. God dwelt in the midst of these people, caring for them, loving them through the generosity of the saints, assuring them, helping them to rebuild their lives, even in the midst of what seemed to be the worst thing 
that could ever occur. God himself will be with them, says the scripture. I love this passage. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain for all of these former things are gone forever. He speaks to us about the inevitability of death. The third century theologian Tertullian wrote, it's a poor thing to fear that which is inevitable, but we do. We despise what seems to be the finality of death. We, we perceive that to be the worst thing. Yet even in the depth of our grief, God is present. Remember those beautiful words of the psalmist, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. Thy presence, they comfort me. Say those words with me, for thou art with me. Just last Sunday, we hosted dear friends at our home for lunch, and after enjoying good food and catching up on our lives for a bit, the conversation sobered as we recalled the anniversary of the death of their son. He passed almost two years ago now after a brief seven-month battle with Ewing's sarcoma. Phil was just 28 years old when he passed peacefully from a body ravaged by cancer into the loving arms of Jesus. The pain of their grief was still palpable in their body language and in their words. None of us expect for our children to pass before us. As for all, their grief has been a journey. And even amidst this worst thing, they spoke of a new thing that God had been orchestrating in their lives. A grief support group, which they were asked to lead at their church, encountering dozens of families whose lives had been altered specifically by the loss of children. Far too many from drug overdoses and suicide, in addition to the afflictions of the body. The presence of our friends and their empathy for those who have walked the very path that they have walked are bringing glimmers of hope to others that are suffering and also balm to their own spirits as they were among those who seek to wipe away their tears. The scripture continues, And death shall be no more, neither shall there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. Listen, for all of the former things have passed away. In the Bible, death is understood in two ways. The obvious inevitable end of physical life on earth as we understand it. But seemingly more emphasis is added on this. Spiritual death which is our alienation and separation from God. Jesus comes as God's representative in love to be the ultimate propitiation and sacrifice, to atone for the sins of humanity. Jesus paid the ultimate price for our salvation, for our reunion with a holy God who loves us and whom we have been estranged from in our sinfulness. As I am fond of saying, Jesus comes to do for us what we are incapable of doing for ourselves. Paul said in Romans chapter 6, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He assures us that we have been reconciled to God through the death of his Son and much more being reconciled. We are saved by his life. Each time, beloved, that we commune at the Lord's table, we do so in remembrance of the one who came to remember us. In other words, to put us back together. To reunite us with the holy God who loves us. Often among the grieving, I've said these words, you may feel as if you were at the end of your rope, but you are never at the end of your hope. 
As I reflect on my active years of ministry, some of the most difficult and heart-wrenching moments were those as I stood at the grave and ministered to families who'd lost a child, whether in utero or at birth or tragically following an accident or illness. In that, there's also a sense of deep privilege to have been a representative of God, a comforting symbol of hope that God is always with us. One scholar referred to biblical hope in this way, as forward-looking faith. Sometimes in our grief, it's difficult to see past that. But hope is a belief not on what we can see, not on what we're experiencing, but on our confident belief in the Word of God that God is doing a new thing. And therein we find our joy and peace. The scripture says, and the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. Popular Christian author Max Lucado speaks of his boyhood days when a dad would gather on the street each afternoon to play football. This dad was a diehard football buff and would sometimes join the kids, always for whatever team happened to be losing that day. Lakato said his appearance in the huddle changed the entire ball game. He was confident and strong, and most of all, he always had a plan. And the kids were fired up by his leadership and emboldened by his plans, and they would play with new determination when he joined them. In his book, The Grip of Grace, Lakato makes the point that that's what Jesus does for us. He, he comes to join the losing team, and his appearance in the game has absolutely changed everything. For he was a leader who inspired hope and confidence and courage and love in his disciples. And he had a plan, a plan so amazing and outrageous that no one, not even his disciples, truly understood it at first, maybe even after his death and resurrection. And now... All of Jesus' followers can be sure that we are going to win this game in the end. Finally, one of our spiritual disciplines as Christ followers is to witness to the hope that is within us. To witness to that presence which is a part of us. 1 Peter 3.15 And if someone asks about hope as a believer in you, always be ready to explain it. A woman fought a long and difficult battle with cancer, and when she passed away, her brother found among her many things his sister's Bible. Inside that Bible, he found tucked away a handwritten poem that she had circled, and the words said this, Often on the rock I tremble, faint of heart and weak of knee, but the steadfast rock of ages never trembles under me. In her life, and even after her passing, she witnessed to the hope to which she had tenaciously clung. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Even when we feel as if we are at the end of our rope, beloved, we are never at the end of our hope. Because of Jesus, even the worst thing in life is not the last thing. I love the words of a song by Don Francisco. He's alive, he's alive, and I'm forgiven. Heaven's gates are open wide. May we go from this place today confidently knowing that God has set up residence in us. Assured in our hearts and minds that nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Emboldened by the tenacious hope that is within us. Testifying to our belief that God will stand with us through the worst of our times. And when our days are complete, resting in the comfort that God is making all things new. Amen.
is at this time that we have the opportunity to pray together. And we would love to hear your prayer requests. So if you go to bakermemorialchurch.org and the online button, you'll see three options there. One for giving us your prayer request and letting us uh, have a community that prays for you. In addition, giving your attendance. And we thank you for your generosity, for your donations, tithes, and offerings that you give each week. And you can see the button there for online giving. Would you please join me as we pray together? Oh, ever-present and caring God, we come before you as a community of believers who want to trust you in all things. Inspire us to remember the hope that is found through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection for new life. And let us remember that Jesus makes all things new here in the present and the life everlasting. We give praise and celebrations to all our confirmation students who were confirmed last Sunday as they proclaimed their faith in you and took vows as members of your church locally and universally. Ignite in us our own faith, commitment, and dedication to you and your church. We also celebrate with all those who have graduated and will be graduating. Bring forth your goodness in the days ahead as each prepares for their next steps in life. There are situations, problems, concerns, heartaches, and pain in this life that can tend to lead to stress, frustration, uncertainty, fear, sadness, and injustice, such as unnecessary shootings of innocent people unavailable products that are needed for nutrition and sustenance in life, illnesses that prevent us from everyday life and routines or what we might call normalcy, hatred, violence, and wars that uproot lives and take lives, those dealing with mental illness, and others that do not receive the proper care and concern due to the variety of mental health concerns. Your constant presence in our lives brings to us the reminder that you walk this journey of life with us and you are the provider of everlasting care and your all-powerful love can sustain us and give us reason to hope because you are doing new things. So we turn to you now for that hope. Lead us with your strength, your wisdom, your compassion, and your guidance. Direct us to carry out that love and hope and care in the world. We seek your justice within systems that are broken and your peace where there's chaos and division. Your overarching care is a reminder that you wipe away our tears when we grieve and we mourn. We pray for the tragedies that have occurred in California, New York, Ukraine, and the Geneva community. May each sense comfort and care during these days ahead and be renewed by the hope that is found in you. May your Holy Spirit bring about peace, comfort, and healing, whether it be in this life or in the next, as we pray for those who are hurt, injured, ill, and ailing in any way, mind, body, and spirit, or that are transitioning from this life to the next. We take a moment to lift up those situations that are on our hearts and the people that are in our minds. And we come before you asking for your forgiveness. If we ourselves have caused any harm, whether intentionally or unknowingly. Thank you for your presence, your love and your care. And we come as a community now to pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Have a blessed week and go in peace, knowing that you have a God that is present with you at every moment. 
know that there are new things ahead. See you next week. Bye-bye.